Well, hello, Redeemer Bible Church family. My name is Curtis. I'm one of the pastors here, and I want to welcome you to today's Daily Word. Uh, today, we're going to be focused on uh, Mark chapter 13, specifically verses 1 through 13. And th Mark chapter 13 as a whole is this incredible sermon given by Jesus to his disciples um, about the end times, and it's known as the Olivet Discourse. And the reason it's known as the Olivet Discourse is because he is with his disciples on the Mount of Olives, which was just east of the temple. And so this conversation happens in the middle of Passion Week. And in chapter 14, we begin the events leading up to his crucifixion. And so this is this last time with his disciples where he's teaching them. And in fact, it's the last time that he's going to come out of the temple and will never return back in because he's crucified before that would happen again. And so today, as I said, we're going to focus on verses 1 through 13. And so uh, join, me, join me, if you will, in verse 1. And we're going to read the first couple of verses and then we'll chat for a little bit. So verse 1. And as he, Jesus, came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. He's talking about the temple, of course. And Jesus said to him, do you see these great buildings? There will not be one left, excuse me, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Every stone is going to be torn down. And so Jesus responds to his disciples, and it's kind of a buzzkill. I mean, they're sort of marveling at the temple, and Jesus says, hey, yeah, and it's going to all be destroyed. Every stone is going to be torn down. And, and it wasn't just this one unnamed disciple Mark focuses on him, uh, but Ma uh, Matthew 24 tells us that it was actually all the disciples were in on this. They were all sort of marveling at the majesty and the beauty of the temple, and he tells them it's going to be destroyed. Now, this would have been hard for them to fathom for uh, different reasons. One of them, though, would have been because of the sheer size and majesty of the temple. This temple was built by the Herodian dynasty in order to win over Jewish favor, but also to leave as a lasting monument to the Herodian line. And so it was awesome. Herod the Great began rebuilding the temple in 19 BC, and then it was finished in 64 AD. So that's about 85 years of building time that went into the temple. In fact, it was an architectural wonder of the ancient world. So just a, a few things to consider about it. Number one, um, it was about one-sixth of the land area of old Jerusalem. And Josephus, who was a first-century Jewish historian, said that it was built with large white stones, polished and generously decorated with gold. Can you picture that? According to Josephus, the stones, get this, were 37 by 12 by 18 feet in size. Massive. And he also wrote that it was, quote, greatly amazing. So to the Jews, nothing was as magnificent or formidable as their temple. And Jesus had just told the disciples, in the midst of them marveling at it, that the entire complex is going to one day be completely leveled. And, and in and in him saying this, Jesus uses the emphatic double negative twice. So, so like as strongly as he can emphasize to the disciples, he is emphasizing with certainty that this is going to happen. So the destruction of the temple by a foreign power, as it was in Jeremiah's day, would be God's judgment on a rebellious Israel. And so it's coming. In fact, the fulfillment of this prediction was um, or took place in AD 70. And that's when Jerusalem and the temple both were destroyed by Titus, the Roman general who later, be, later became emperor. In fact, to this day, there's the Arch of Titus, which commemorates this victory, and it still stands in Rome. So uh, this was a big deal. And, and really, it's a tragedy because both uh, Jerusalem and the temple were razed to the ground. They were burned and destroyed. So with that in mind, let's move forward into verse 3. It says, And he, Jesus, sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple. Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things be? 
And what will be the sign when these things are about to be accomplished? So we have to understand that the disciples' perspective was only based on Old Testament prophecy. And so they didn't see, they weren't envisioning a long period of time between the temple's destruction and the end time events that are ultimately would culminate in the coming of the Son of Man. So they thought it was going to happen one after the other. And so they essentially thought the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple would initiate the messianic kingdom. So they're wanting to know when this is going to happen. And so they asked two questions. When would this happen? And what would be the sign that it's about to happen? They're anticipating that they're, even in the language, there, there's this immediacy to it that, that they think they're going to see all of it. And so um, Jesus begins negatively by first warning them against false signs of the end in verses 5 to 13. So what he does is instead of answering their first question first, he answers their second question first and then their first question second. So we'll look, we'll look at that as we go here. So again, he, in verses 5 through 13, he, he has sort of this negative approach to warning them against false signs that the end is about to happen. And then in verses 14 through 27, which we'll look at tomorrow, um, he positively teaches them about these notable events that initiate, in fact, the end. And he describes the second coming of when he returns. And then in the final verses, 28 through 32 of this chapter, uh, he then answers their first question about when. So that's sort of the order that he approaches this in. So let's begin in verse, verses 5 and 6. Uh, the first false sign is found there. And Jesus said, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and they will lead you astray. Or excuse me, they will lead many astray. The Greek word for see to it can also be translated as be on guard, beware. So he's giving them this warning. And, and, and the, the tense of the verb is the present imperative, which means it is a command to continually be on guard, always continually be on guard from, for false messiahs, of which there have, in fact, been many throughout history. And Matthew 24 in fact, tells us that toward the end, before the end comes, the, the number of false messiahs is going to increase. And so with that in mind, let's move into verses 7 and 8, because Jesus helps, us to un helps them to understand, and really us by extension, that wars and earthquakes and famine in and of themselves don't mean that the end is about to take place, that the end is at hand. In fact, these things, um, you know, wars and earthquakes and famines, are common of this age. However, he does say that these are but the beginnings of the labor pains. And so what he's helping them to understand is, okay, yes, these things are common, but they don't mean in and of themselves that the end is about to happen. However, they are the beginning of the labor pains. And so if you think about labor, when a woman goes into labor, the pains that she experiences happen infrequently at first, and they're not as painful. But as the labor goes on, as it approaches the birth, those pains happen uh, closer and closer together, and they are stronger and stronger and stronger. And, and so what he's telling us is, is that things like wars and earthquakes and famine will pick up speed and intensity over time. And they will happen uh, more in strength, they will happen more often, until finally the end comes to us. So with that in mind, he warns them. So, so what are some of these other things that are going to be happening? In verse 9, Jesus tells them again to be on guard as they will be persecuted for following him. Verses 9 through 13, this last section we're going to look at today, details the persecution that they're going to experience from Jewish religious leaders, from Gentile authorities, and even their closest family. So let's just sort of as an overview, I just want to touch on each of those briefly. So, they will be delivered, he says, over to the councils. Now, the councils, literally, that word there is Sanhedrins, which were the local Jewish courts held in synagogues. And they would be ultimately publicly flogged. Now, to be flogged meant that they would receive 39 strokes. Um, and, and what, you know, they would be whipped, and there was these 
um, shards in there that as they would pull it out, they would rip the flesh out. 39 was the number because they felt like anything more than that, a person was likely to die. And so Jesus is giving them this sober warning that in addition to keep in mind, there's going to be this level of persecution um, from Jewish religious leaders. Uh, he, he helps them to understand also that they would be made to understand before Gentile civic authorities. And ultimately, those moments would be opportunities for them to be able to proclaim the gospel. In fact, we see both of these sayings, both what took place with Jewish religious leaders and them standing in front of Gentile authorities. We see both of these things uh, come to pass in the book of Acts. But Jesus, in the midst of that, assures them, comforts them with the words that they don't need to be anxious when they're before these Gentile authorities or just persecution about what they're going to say because the Holy Spirit is going to give them the words that they need to say in that moment. So, so God, even in those moments, hasn't abandoned them. He's going to be with them. He's going to supply them with what they need to know and say in that moment to glorify the Lord and proclaim the gospel. And so that's also encouraging for us because God will do the same for us. And in verse 10, Jesus tells them, and by extension us, that the gospel must be proclaimed to all nations. So, so not just before the Gentile civic authorities, although they will, and we see that in Acts, but ultimately the gospel is going to be proclaimed throughout the earth, proclaimed to all the nations. And in fact, when you think about it, proclaiming the gospel to unbelievers is the one thing that we can't do in heaven. And so we're called to do it now. And by God's grace, as we do, God adds to the number of people who will be his children and will be in heaven with us forever. It is his priority for this age that we do this, no matter the responses of other people. But Jesus doesn't pull any punches about uh, some of the responses, whether it's being um, flogged publicly um, or, when we, as we see in this, toward the end of this passage, where he talks about family members that will deliver other family members over to death because Christians will be hated for his sake. See, Jesus doesn't promise us this perfect, easy life. You know, when we're in heaven, we're in paradise, free from sin and death and suffering and persecution. But here, God's honest with us. And Jesus here tells us that there's going to be this level of persecution in our life, even at times, family members delivering us over for death because of our faith in Christ. And clearly, we're going to be hated for his sake. He states that plainly in this passage. However, he ends with great hope for us. If we are a genuine believer, then if you look at verse 13, he says, the one who endures to the end will be saved. That's incredibly hopeful. So, so the end here refers not, not to the end of days, um, not to when Christ is going to come back for us and set everything right. The end refers to the end of one's life. And so the one who endures this persecution that he's talking about for the name and glory of Christ to the end of their life, the one who stands firm is a true Christian. What he's not saying is, is that um, this is how we're saved. In other words, if we endure to the end, now through that we will find salvation. Uh, what he's saying is, is that this, this endurance is evidence of our salvation, not that it grants salvation. And there's a lot of verses we could go to. A, a helpful um, verse in particular, Ephesians 2.9, makes it clear that our salvation is by grace alone and by faith alone, and not by works. And so when we think about persecution, when we think about the suffering that we experience in this life, uh, it it ends for a Christian, and we are ushered into paradise. Uh, as one pastor would say about suffering and persecution, it can only last a lifetime, and then we have eternity with Christ in heaven, in the very presence of our Savior, with no more suffering, no more persecution, no more sickness, no more death, no more hate, just experiencing the glory and love of grace and grace of Christ forever and ever and ever. And that is amazing hope. Well, all right, that is it for today. And as I said, tomorrow we'll pick up with the second part of, um, of our uh, chapter today, Mark 13, and we will look at other things that, that Jesus talks about as it refers to uh, end times. 
All right, everyone, God bless, and I will see you tomorrow.